and specifically. Good afternoon, good morning, and welcome everyone to today's webinar with Dr. Irene Harris and Tim Usset, titled Psycho-Spiritual Development and Moral Injury, Implications for Patient and Staff Care. I'm Andrew Andresco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are delighted you could all join us. The response to this webinar has been amazing. As of this morning, we had well over 700, but it's pretty close to 800 registrants. Uh, I just want to take a moment at the top here to thank our good friends and co-sponsor for this event, the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab. You can learn more about the network at their website, chaplaincyinnovation.org. Uh, just some housekeeping instructions. You'll notice a dashboard on your screen as well. Um, you are listening in using your computer speaker system by default and are muted. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to our guests by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel that's located at the side of the screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. If you have any tech questions, you can chat in the separate chat box and they'll come to me and I can see those and do what I can. Uh, one last thing, I do want to mention that our next webinar is actually being held next Monday, January 11th at 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Central, titled Chaplain Documentation, a Review of Charting Spiritual Care, the Emerging Role of Chaplaincy Records in Global Healthcare. Uh, for more information, visit our website at trans transformchaplaincy.org. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. George Fichet, Executive Director of Transform Chaplaincy. Andy, thanks so much. I uh, appreciate all your good work to help us um, uh, make these webinars work. Um, friends, um, good day to you all. Happy New Year. Um, I want to acknowledge as we begin that we are beginning the new year uh, with a lot of stresses and a lot of people who are working in healthcare and a lot of chaplains um, in particular are aware uh, of those stresses. Um, uh, the, um, the, the coronavirus is surging in a number of areas and we see news reports that are really quite distressing about the kind of overwhelming number of cases that some of you and your colleagues are facing. Um, and we want you to know that we're thinking about you, holding you in the light. We're aware that the vaccine has become available and a um, number of us have received the vaccine and we're feeling um, good about that. But it's troubling as well, right? It's not coming out as quickly as we want and it's um, um, concerns about people being unsure about it. So uh, a lot of things on our mind around the virus and the vaccine. And on top of that, today <clears throat> is a day when there's a lot on our minds about what's happening in Washington and the political life of the country. So here we are starting the, a difficult, uh, with a difficult start to the new year. And we want to just be mindful uh, about all those things, uh, aware that they're part of um, what we're bringing to today's um, um, conversation. Um, I should also say that in addition to some of the instability there is um, uh, politically and um, uh, medically, I have been having some uh, problems with instability in my internet connection. Uh, generally, they don't last very long. I cut out for about 60 seconds and my friends and colleagues actually are relieved sometimes when I disappear and they're glad for me to be gone. Uh, if I freeze up for a few minutes, um, uh, just keep talking. Um, I'll be back again. It doesn't last too long. I want to say that I'm really very excited uh, about today's uh, uh, webinar and the research about psycho-spiritual development uh, that our colleagues will be presenting uh, to us. Um, about 40 years ago, uh, James Fowler published a book called Stages of Faith. Um, and um, soon after the book was published, I began reading it and began thinking about it and began reading related things, even had a chance to go hear Fowler speak once uh, or twice. Um, and, and I thought that what he was pointing to and what other colleagues were pointing to about ways in which faith changes for some people as they mature 
was really very interesting and very exciting. And I thought it had potential to help us understand our own growth uh, and journey in faith. And it had a potential to help us understand the growth uh, and changes in faith for patients and families that we work with. Um, so it, it felt to me like this was really an exciting new development that had a lot of potential for uh, chaplains. Um, uh, but it seems like it didn't catch on. Uh, it was with us for a while. It was part of our awareness for a while. But um, it didn't really influence spiritual care or teaching spiritual care very much as I was aware of it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some of you will correct me as we get into this conversation. It certainly hasn't shown up in research about spiritual care. So, for example, if we think about the case study research uh, that has developed over the last 10 years, if we think about the 40 or so case studies that chaplains have published about their work, I'm pretty familiar with those case studies. And I don't think there's one of them in which in the commentary on the case, the chaplains actually um, thought about um, faith development or psycho-spiritual development um, as part of their thinking about the case. So I'm really very excited actually about the work that uh, Irene Harris and Tim Ussett and their colleagues have been doing to kind of bring to our consciousness um, that um, psycho-spiritual development may play a very important role in how patients and families and staff colleagues are coping with stressful situations, that we can actually have an important theoretical framework for understanding what's happening, and we actually can begin to measure it so that we can do research about it. So I'm really very excited about today's presentation and want to uh, uh, take a minute now to introduce our presenters. Um, Tim Ussett uh, uh, is a board certified chaplain and licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Minnesota. Tim is a PhD student in health services research policy and administration in the health policy and management division of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. All right, Tim. And Tim is also a former uh, uh, Transforming Chaplaincy Research Fellow. Throughout his career, Tim has worked extensively with moral injury, spiritual distress, and post-traumatic stress disorder on numerous research projects and in clinical areas with with the Veterans Health Administration. By pursuing his PhD, Tim plans to expand his research interests to include the impact of moral distress, moral injury, and burnout on healthcare um, workers' well being and patient health outcomes. Currently, Tim is an executive director for the, Z for the Physician Wellness Collaborative, which is a nonprofit organization that supports physician wellness and mental health. And Tim is also a brigade chaplain uh, in the Army Reserves. Joining Tim is Dr. Irene Harris. Dr. Harris has been researching relationships between spirituality and mental health since the late 1990s. She holds a master's degree in education and rehabilitation counseling, as well as a PhD in counseling psychology. Uh, Irene has received an award as a national leader in applied psychology um, of religion and spirituality from the American Psychological Association's Division 36, the Division for the Psychology of Religion and Spirituality. Dr. Harris, um, uh, since beginning her work in the VA health system um, starting in 2002, she has focused on spiritually integrated care uh, for PTSD and moral injury. Dr. Harris is a leader in developing an intervention called Building Spiritual Strengths, which is a chaplain-led spiritually integrated treatment for PTSD and moral injury that has been proven in two published peer review randomized clinical trials. Among her publications, uh, Irene is a co-editor of an American Psychological Association volume, Trauma, Meaning, and Spirituality, Translating Research into Clinical Practice. Perhaps a few of you will remember that in the spring of 2012, or Irene, I'm going way back there, the spring of 2012, which was the first year of the American, of, of the Association of Professional Chaplains Webinar Journal Club that Pat Murphy and I were teaching, we invited Irene to discuss her 2011 paper that reported on the first randomized clinical trial from the Building Spiritual Strengths Intervention. Um, and since then, I've been uh, aware of Irene's work and following her work and just really excited that she can join us today um, for the webinar. Uh, 
Finally, I want to introduce you all to Kristen Godlin. Kristen is a board certified chaplain and a former Transforming Chaplaincy Fellow. And Kristen is now a doctoral candidate, go Kristen, at the University of Illinois. Kristen's doctoral work focuses on the use of religion in coping with intimate partner violence. And Kristen's dissertation will focus on women's conceptualizations of forgiveness and the impact of those conceptualizations on health outcomes for those women, including empowerment, resilience, and spiritual well-being. And I've asked Kristen to join us in part uh, because of her overlapping uh, research interests on issues of uh, trauma, um, but also actually to help us um, um, by moderating the Q&A session uh, as we come up to the end of the session. So Andy, um, can you take us to the next slide? Um, which has the outline for today's presentation. Um, so here's the plan. Um, um, uh, Tim and Irene are going to begin with a summary of the study that shall take us um, uh, through the next 20 or 30 minutes. I'm then going to do some uh, discussion of the study uh, with Tim and Irene, uh, and then uh, Kristen will moderate the Q&A uh, with all of you. Let me say as we begin that the article uh, that reports the research that Tim and Irene are reporting, the reference for it is here on this slide, and it's an open access article. So for those of you um, uh, who want to read the article itself, um, uh, if you um, um, get into um, the journal, um, and, um, that it was published in, which is called Religions. Um, uh, you'll be able to get the whole article yourself and, and download that. And let me also say, uh, people are often interested in whether or not the slides from the presentation will be available. And the answer to that, I believe, is yes. Um, is that right? Yeah. That we will make the slides available so those of you who want to uh, kind of review them uh, can do that. And as Andy has maybe mentioned as he started up, actually, um, the recording uh, of today's presentation will probably be posted uh, by tomorrow, so that will be available. Um, I think uh, that's enough from me. Tim, Irene, let's turn it over to you. Andy, why don't we go to the next slide? All right, thank you, George, uh, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning uh, to those of you in time zones that are still morning. Uh, I'm Tim, and Irene and I will be giving this presentation today, and as well as doing some Q&A. Uh, here's our standard disclaimer slide that uh, more or less uh, anything foolish I or Irene say reflects only on us and not on uh, any of the organizations that we represent. And um, my standard joke, which I'll say again, is that those organizations still retain the right to reprimand us anyway, uh, so not a great deal for us, uh, and we have no conflicts of interest to report. Uh, so go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so I'll, I'll say a little bit about the background of this study from my perspective and I'll let Irene share. She'll have a bit more history on it. Uh, so this study uh, was informed by and, a, and an extension of Irene's work around uh, understanding spirituality and trauma and spiritually integrated care for PTSD, moral injury and spiritual distress. Uh, as we'll talk about here shortly, uh, Fowler stages of faith are a key theoretical underpinning uh, to the building spiritual strength intervention, uh, but also this particular study, uh, which I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, and if there's more background context you want to add, Irene, about what led you to put in uh, for this study, I think it was about five years ago, or maybe six years ago, that the funding request went in, if I'm remembering. That is true. This actually comes from much further back in my research career, I started working with psycho-spiritual development when I was working on my dissertation on the religious lives of the of GLBT people. And in that dissertation, I discovered that psycho-spiritual development was a key construct for mental health. And then I remember as you and I were working together in building spiritual strength, we were both observing that the individual psycho-spiritual development as they would come into the intervention seemed to make a big difference in their capacity to benefit from the intervention. So that's how we got started on the 2015 theoretical paper and moved into seeking funding to get some cold hard data on psycho-spiritual development. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, thank you. And Andy, let's go to the next slide. So, so what we'll do here, uh, we'll talk about a couple uh, background terms that will be helpful in understanding uh, the study and, and what some of the, the variables of interest and, and what was being measured. Uh, and the first term uh, that, we, that we'll talk about, and I'm assuming, I, I'm not seeing the slide advance, but I'm assuming it will here uh, in a moment, uh, is, is moral injury. Uh, and it's a term that many of you have probably heard of by now. Uh, it's a term that uh, was originally coined by Jonathan Shea in the early to mid 90s, uh, based out of his work uh, as a psychiatrist in the VA uh, with a number of Vietnam veterans. Uh, and you can see one of his definitions of moral injury uh, is, was a betrayal of what's right by someone who holds legitimate authority in a high stakes situation. Uh, Brett Litz and colleagues in 2009 uh, kind of expanded that definition to include uh, a number of other things, which could include doing something that violates one moral moral code, spiritual code, or values, uh, witnessing something that violates those values, uh, feeling powerless to address uh, a horrible situation, uh, and also of an inclusive of the, of the betrayal definition. And this term, uh, I would say up until about two to three years ago, was, was largely focused, uh, the research was largely focused within the service member and veteran community, uh, which this study will be inclusive of. Uh, but I think some context to, to be thinking ahead on is that uh, some, uh, particularly in the med medical community, have wondered about this construct relative to healthcare workers. Uh, and if it's uh, explained some of uh, the distressing experiences that people have in healthcare. Uh, and again, not part of this study, but another background term to at least uh, be aware of is moral distress, which is a similar construct and that has been studied significantly in the healthcare literature. Uh, I would say, um, and Irene can disagree with me, the main differences between moral distress and moral injury, if I were to simplify it, is that moral distress as it's defined right now, only accounts for professional or ethics or values. It does not account for personal values in terms of how many of the studies work with it, whereas moral injury as a construct uh, can account for either personal or professional values. I would say it's a both and. Uh, and I, uh, again, as, as more research develops, maybe those terms will be merged, maybe they'll be distinct, uh, but that part um, hasn't been determined yet. And the last background piece on moral injury as a term is that much of the research around moral injury uh, initially existed with veterans that already had a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. So there was a belief that for a while, or for some there still is, that this only exists with someone with a PTSD diagnosis. However, again, in the last two to three years, uh, some of the literature has shown that people can have uh, symptoms, so to speak, though it's not a DSM, DSM-5 diagnosis of moral injury uh, and not meet criteria for, for PTSD and, and vice versa. They could have meet uh, the P DSM-5 uh, criterion for PTSD, uh, but not necessarily endorse moral injury symptoms. Uh, so let's, uh, let's keep going from there. So next slide, Andy. So George already mentioned uh, psycho-spiritual development, which was uh, kind of a, a key uh, piece that we were looking at this study, specifically the relationship between uh, psychospiritual development and moral injury. Uh, and that comes from Fowler's theory or Fowler's stages of faith, um, which were uh, informed or developed somewhat um, in light of, if some of you are familiar with Piaget's work or Kohlberg's stages of moral development, uh, and Fowler expanded that work through a number of interviews across wide age ranges and faith groups uh, in the late 1970s. The, the initial book was published in 1981. Uh, and what you see on the slide are the different stages that, that Fowler came up with. Uh, and we aren't going to go through them in a, in a ton of detail, but I, I think the best way to think about psycho-spiritual development is you're moving from more uh, chaotic and, and concrete in terms of your thinking or how uh, you believe a higher power brings order to your life or to the world, um, where, again, where many of us fall is that roughly that stage three, uh, where we have certain, uh, our belief system is, is supported by uh, different authorities or institutions. So for some, that could be a particular uh, 
uh, well, I guess for, for the Bible, it could be maybe a particular translation, a particular interpretation of the Bible, a particular faith leaders uh, that, they, that they trust, and, and maybe faith leaders from other traditions, or maybe even other tr uh, Christians might, um, I, I guess for lack of a better term, threaten the ordered world that they've come through, through that stages of faith. Uh, and what we see with stages four through six is not that people necessarily lose their faith, or, or join a different faith tradition, uh, but they're able to integrate different moral contexts or different faith traditions or belief systems alongside their own in a way that isn't threatening uh, to their own belief system. So uh, I'm gonna pause here and I, I know Irene can probably explain this better than me and let her chime in here as well. So I, th I think that you explained that extremely well, Tim. I think one of the crucial things that's important as we look at the relationships between moral injury and psychospiritual development is the difference between stage three and stage four. In stage three, we think of that as in like Kohlberg stages, a conventional level of, I will work with concrete data. My concrete data are the rules, what clergy tell me, what public laws and morals are. These are the rules. Things are either right or wrong. We are following the rules or we are not following the rules. So at stage three, moral religious decisions are categorical, right, wrong, yes, no. Um, at stage four, we begin to start to think of these things as being on a continuum. They're, you know, instead of right or wrong, it's now better, worse. We are able to look at things from more than one perspective at a time. Well, in my faith, this is considered the wrong thing to do. But in this faith group, in this culture, it's considered the right thing to do. And when you look at the cultural context for people in that faith group, here's why this is the right thing to do. And here's why it's wrong and so maybe what is right or wrong is context dependent so it's a more sophisticated look at the at perspectives or multiple moral contexts on a decision the issue is that most of the american public never gets to stage four and if i were thinking about this as a clergy person I am not sure I would be all in a hurry to provide my congregation with the level of religious education that gets them to the point where they are willing to question me. You know, there is a lot of, there are a lot of cultural reasons why most of our population doesn't get to stage four. Most common faiths in the U.S. stop religious education around age 12, where we should be in about stage three and most of us stay there for the rest of our lives. I feel like I'm just yapping now. So I will stop digressing on this and we can go on. Yeah, well, no, thank you for the clarification. Andy, let's let's go to the next slide. We'll start to talk about the study design. Uh, so what, what we set up in this study, it was a, a cross-sectional survey, uh, meaning so we're, we're measuring these different uh, variables at the same time point. Uh, which there, there's some limitations to that that we'll get to later, uh, but the measures included some demographics, uh, the, the scale that uh, Irene uh, and I came up with around uh, stages of faith and post-conventional religious functioning, uh, the moral injury event scale, uh, which that scale measures uh, exposure uh, to potentially morally injurious to get events. Uh, the PTSD checklist five is a, again, a self-report survey that someone fills out uh, to determine uh, if they meet a clinically significant cutoff for post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and then the moral injury questionnaire we also use, which is another measure of moral injury, which measures both exposure and to some degree also symptoms of moral injury that, that individuals might be experiencing. And what, uh, what we measured, that, or I should say how the study was done, it was a, a sample of individuals uh, in a VA that had previously received care for PTSD. Um, so th that, that, that's who was answering these questions. Uh, and there's some benefits to that and some limitations, which we'll speak to uh, in a little bit. Uh, but let's go ahead and go to the next slide. 
Uh, so here, uh, relative uh, to the, the these scale around post-conventional religious functioning, there's four categories uh, that come out of that that will be important here in a moment. Uh, and if again, thinking of Fowler stages of faith, think conventional as roughly stage three. Um, so someone who's a conventional affiliate means they're roughly stage three and Fowler stages of faith, and they're still affiliated with their faith tradition or belief system. Uh, a conventional disaffiliate means that person is again Fowler stage three in terms of their thinking, uh, but they've disaffiliated uh, from their faith tradition or belief system. Uh, similarly, a post-conventional affiliate that could be stage four or beyond, uh, someone who is still associated with their faith tradition or belief system, uh, and then post-conventional disaffiliate is someone that again is stage four -ish or beyond and is disaffiliated from uh, their faith tradition or belief system. And I guess it is worth pointing out as an aside here is that those that were using language such as religion or spirituality, I've, I've shifted to language of belief system uh, because it's actually possible uh, Fowler's stages can actually even be helpful in conceptualizing uh, those that don't uh, adhere to a faith tradition, someone that's an agnostic or someone that's an atheist, because the way that one holds that belief system can actually uh, process-wise be similar to how someone holds a religious belief system, uh, which is, uh, again, I think both fascinating and also in, in some ways can help us understand people who content-wise might be very different, uh, but process-wise might be very similar in terms of how they orient and make meaning to their world. Irene, is there more you want to add on on any of these categories? Um, I, I do think that your point is really important about one can be disaffiliated from faith at either a conventional or post-conventional level. In fact, one of the reasons we worked on developing this instrument together is we had been using the Fowler Religious Attitude Scale revised to measure psycho-spiritual development in the studies we were working on together before and found out that conventional disaffiliates were appearing post-conventional on this instrument, that there was a problem in how we were measuring it. And that's why we needed the new measure that we developed for this study. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so the next slide is demographics. Uh, I'll touch this briefly, uh, but then we'll move on so we have time for other things. So it was a total of 212 veterans. Um, uh, some, uh, diversity relative to male, female, not as much as we would like to see, but as you go down further, you can see not a lot of age diversity in terms of average age, uh, not a ton of racial diversity with the majority uh, of the sample being Caucasian. Uh, and then in terms of religions, we did a little bit better relative to Protestant, Catholic, uh, with some agnostics, atheists, uh, Buddhists, a, a few uh, Jewish individuals, Muslim, Hindu, uh, and with 16% not specified, which again, we'll talk limitations in a moment, but with any study you have to think about, okay, is how generalizable is this? And there are some limitations here in terms of mm -hmm. the demographics. Uh, so let's go ahead to the key findings. And Irene, I'll let you take this. Okay. So what we found when we, and when we took a look at the final analysis is that individuals who were conventional disaffiliates had higher levels of distress, higher levels of essentially moral injury syndrome symptoms. We were controlling for the exposure to potentially morally injurious events in that equation. So we put into the equation exposure to potentially morally injurious events and severity of PTSD, as well as there, we put in the variables as either conventional disaffiliate or conventional affiliate, and discovered in that, that those who were disaffiliates, given, you know, controlling for the amount of risk, the amount of distress they had experienced, conventional disaffiliates were having much higher levels of distress. On the other hand, people who were conventional but were still affiliated with their faith um, were having less distress that the conventional affiliate level of faith development seemed to be protective. And then what was interesting was when we looked outside of the conventional level and we looked at affiliate disaffiliate status and we ran 
the same type of analysis at the post-conventional level, we did not find differences across affiliates and disaffiliates. I personally think that that's interesting because as I was looking at the instrument and I was looking at high scores across the four subscales, it was very easy to tell the difference between conventional disaffiliates and conventional affiliates. Their subscale differences were quite sharp. But let's think a little bit about what post-conventional religiosity looks like. Somebody who's post-conventionally religious says, well, I value my faith community and I value the traditions and rules and laws and expectations, and I'm very capable of questioning them. And maybe I even value being part of my faith community and maybe I don't believe in a God or I have my doubts about God or I have decided whether or not God exists isn't necessarily pivotal in my faith. And so when we start trying to look at affiliation versus disaffiliated status at the post-conventional level, those two groups actually look very similar to one another in their functioning. So I think we need to do a little more work to tease out the measurement there. But it's very interesting that we no longer have that level of distress associated with disaffiliation when we get to the post-conventional level. Um, Tim, Irene, I just want to give you a heads up. There's a few questions coming in the question uh, um, uh, box and actually folks, just a reminder that please use the question box for questions about the substance here. Um, the language of um, uh, conventional, post-conventional, affiliate, disaffiliate is a language that you guys have gotten very familiar with and um, as I read the article I was beginning to understand, but it's probably brand new to almost everybody else who's listening. So not everyone is actually um, 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 on the train and following you all. Uh, so it may be useful actually to go back two slides to that slide where you had the four different groups, Tim. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. And, and just uh, uh, summarize again the fact that you have kind of used your scale to um, identify four different subgroups uh, mm -hmm. uh, among your study participants. And, and the four different subgroups are actually created by using two different axes. Um, so, so just go over that one more time for people for whom that's a little new. Yeah, well, I'll, um, I'll, I'll say something and then Irene, you can clarify if I missed anything. So if we think about the two axes, we, we have uh, conventional and post-conventional. So in this case, uh, conventional uh, lining up with roughly stage three on Fowler stages of faith mm -hmm. uh, and post-conventional uh, lining up with roughly stage four or beyond uh, on Fowler stages of faith. Uh, so again, thinking about, uh, again, the more, the more literal, um, I, I'll use the term rigid holding of a belief system or bringing order to the world uh, compared to a, a belief system that's more flexible or can handle difference with less distress uh, would be one way of, of framing those, that axis. The other is affiliate. So you're still affiliated with your belief system or faith tradition. Uh, and then from there, the, the, it would be disaffiliate. So you're no longer affiliated uh, with your belief system or faith tradition, which is something uh, and, and trauma research or in the literature, it's, it's quite common for someone uh, to disaffiliate from their belief system or faith tradition after a singular or numerous traumatic events. Um, so that's part of why we're wanting to look at that. Does that kind of answer what, what the questions you're seeing, George? Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, you know, we may have to go over it again, uh, but uh, why don't we move on? Um, you know, finish the study findings, the discussion that you have, and then let's yeah. see how we do here. Yeah, I think yeah, and for and the go back time, on. I think limitations was where they were. Yeah, so very briefly. So again, this is a cross-sectional design. Uh, so because of that, uh, we can't just determine causality. So within these, with the limitations or these findings, we can say that there's an association uh, between these different categories that we've described around conventional affiliate, conventional, post-conventional affiliate, disaffiliate, et cetera, and uh, the measure we were using for moral injury, uh, the moral injury questionnaire, but we can't say 
um, that this is causal, so this caused this. We can simply say this is associated at this point. Um, and again, this is more of a, I don't know if I quite call it a pilot study, but it was an exploratory study to see if that association was there uh, to maybe justify uh, more robust longitudinal studies in the future. Um, there are still existing shortcomings with moral injury measures. Uh, and uh, I've already mentioned the, the sample lack diversity in a number of different demographic areas. Uh, and let's let's keep going um, for the sake of time so we ensure we have enough time for questions. Uh, so Irene, do you wanna take this slide? Sure. So trying to take these findings and contextualize them back into the literature from which they came. There are now a number of research studies that show that when people lose their faith in the context of their mental health outcomes tend to be worse. Our clinical experience from working with Building Spiritual Strength Group is that that distress comes from having a stage three higher power construct. I sometimes joke with veterans about a bubblegum God concept, bubblegum machine God concept. I did what I was supposed to. I read my scripture and I prayed and I tried to live a godly life. I put my quarter in the bubblegum machine. God's supposed to take care of me now. I'm supposed to get a gumball. But when we pray for the safety of our unit and our unit winds up being overrun or in an unsafe situation, wait, wait, I put my quarter in the bubblegum machine. I didn't get a gumball. God has let me down. This is not a construct of God that can survive trauma or survive morally ambiguous types of situations. So what we have done in building spiritual strength is help these veterans who have this really concrete God construct that can't survive the battlefield become more complex. Instead of things being good or evil, move them into better or worse and allow people to understand that you know, there was civilian laws and religious laws and the rules of engagement and a lot of other moral contexts so that you could be right in one moral context and wrong in another moral context. So we have to take right and wrong out of the discussion and move the veteran into discussing whether he or she was able to do anything better or worse in that situation. Basically, when somebody's at the conventional level and they have these experiences that essentially shatter the God construct that they carry with them at the time, they have two choices. They can abandon the God, abandon the God construct that they had. And I think that is the coping approach that leads to the Ben Ezra 2010, Turkuel 2014. There are other findings, Fontana and Rosenheck 2004, all of this research that shows when trauma survivors lose their faith, we have poor mental health outcomes. What we have found associated with better mental health outcomes in our treatment of veterans with moral injury is if we can assist the veteran in revising a God construct to be something that is more complex, more consistent with stage four Fowler functioning, then we take that distress that seems to be uniquely related to the conventional disaffiliate level, and we're able to neutralize that distress and help people to function again. Now, does that make sense, Tim? Is there something in there I should be explaining more carefully? No, I, I would say let's let's go to the next slide and we'll, we'll trust uh, more will come out in the questions. And then, yeah, do, do you wanna take questions for future research too? Sure, I can take this. So one of the things that I thought was interesting about the data coming out of this research is it was consistent with our clinical experience in that we were expecting to see distress associated with conventional disaffiliates. I was expecting to see post-conventional religious functioning acting much as conventional affiliation as essentially being a buffer or some sort of protective factor that did not show up in this research and we need to do some more research to find out why some of that might have been that this is a new instrument maybe we need to refine our classification of post-conventional affiliate affiliate disaffiliate 
Um, we need to look at whether our findings are associated with lifetime or current moral injury symptoms. And we need to check perhaps the clinical observations that Tim and I have had are biased in favor of our theory. So there's a lot of things that we still need to look at. We also need to do some longitudinal research because there is, for example, cross-sectional research, negative religious coping shows up as being related to poorer mental health outcomes. But in longitudinal research, it appears that negative religious coping is a springboard that first makes things worse and eventually launches people into greater spiritual growth. From a cross-sectional study, we can't tell if that's what's going on with that. So we can go to the next slide at this point. All right, well, here's some, again, some implications for patient and staff care. Uh, and I know we'll probably touch more on this in the Q&A area. Uh, but a big part of the, the webinar today is to, uh, if you weren't familiar, familiarize you, or if you had forgotten about Fowler uh, or a psycho-spiritual uh, model to remind you of that, uh, and you know, go. You can go probably find his book at a used bookstore or, or online for probably not very much anymore. Or if you want to, you can read our articles about it. Uh, but I think it's really important when you're providing care, whether it's to patients or staff, uh, to have this uh, psycho-spiritual developmental model in your mind as a clinician, whether you're a mental health professional or a or a chaplain, uh, and kind of wonder to yourself, what, what is the what distress is, is this person experiencing? And is it related to a collision of moral contexts uh, or value systems? And, and I think that's especially important right now in the pandemic uh, where we have uh, healthcare workers uh, that um, whether uh, they've been trained for it to, to implement a patient-centered model of care being asked to implement a utilitarian model of care, those are, those are different moral contexts. Those are different value systems that are colliding. Um, and that's, uh, a really kind of heady uh, w way of saying, and that's not even talking about just the human suffering and, and the volume that's being seen right now uh, by healthcare workers and whether they're bedside or not, and the risks that they're putting themselves in and their families in by going to work every day. Uh, and this expands the people uh, beyond healthcare too, when you think about uh, the, uh, I guess I, I don't want to be political, but there are a large number of people who aren't wearing masks. So that means if they go to the grocery store while they're sick, they're potentially exposing people working at a grocery store or a gas station or all those other things. Uh, so the other part of this, uh, I think of doing good clinical work around psycho-spiritual development is doing your own reflection on, on where are you in this process and how um, are your biases coming up in terms of is your own level of psycho-spiritual development maybe a barrier to you and the care that you're able to provide uh, in certain contexts to certain populations or in certain situations. Uh, and it's true of all of us, so we're all human, uh, but I think this model can be helpful in us as we reflect on and, and refine our clinical practice. Uh, and with that said, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to George for some, some additional questions, and then we'll take questions uh, from those of you joining us. Thanks, uh, Tim, Irene, really appreciate um, 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 your description of your project and uh, introducing us to these important concepts. Um, uh, a number of people uh, in the Q&A have actually um, noted um, that when Fowler's work came out, there has been some critical conversation about it. Um, uh, feminists have kind of talked about the fact that uh, faith development and moral development for women may not be the same as it is for men. Fowler's sample uh, mostly focused on uh, women or Kohlberg's sample focused, I'm sorry, Kohlberg's sample focused on men and things like that. Do you have any um, uh, comments um, about um, our kind of using um, a framework um, like psycho-spiritual development in light of the kind of critical um, uh, comments that have been about uh, the stages of faith? Uh, so first of all, I completely agree with the feminist discourse that Kohlberg did include women in his sample, but the way he interpreted those findings qualitatively was to say that those who chose individualist resolutions to moral dilemmas were at higher stages of development than those who chose collectivist solutions. 
And that is, you know, because women are taught to take care of families, take care of groups, especially at that time in history. Um, that is a legitimate criticism. I will say a lot of the feminist work by Carol Gilligan and that group of researchers who bring that issue into question and began to take a look at collectivist and relationist views of psycho-spiritual development more carefully. They're important, they are right, and just the fact of their very existence and bringing up the issue actually changed the culture such that women are now more likely to choose individualist resolutions to moral development than they were. And there has been research since there showing that women and men are becoming more morally and spiritually alike in our culture since that group of, re since that set of studies were initially explored. Um, that said, I still agree that we need to interpret findings based on Fowler with some caution, and in particular when applying that research to women, we need to think carefully about how we make judgment. One of the things that Tim and I are trying to do with this is not dis not present conventional or post-conventional as necessarily better or worse, but as things that have functional implications and work with people to be functioning in a way that works for them. Does that make sense? Um, Irene, I appreciate that. It, um, I think it's very helpful, um, yeah. Um, Andy, can you look at the next slide for, uh, with us? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm going to just kind of uh, in, interact with Tim and Irene here about a couple of things, and then we're going to um, turn it over to Kristen for the Q&A from others here, the, what questions that Kristen has been noting. But I, I, I wanted to actually make a historical note. Some chaplains who are my age may be aware, uh, actually, that the, the notion of psycho-spiritual development, um, particularly that kind of conventional and post-conventional approach to faith um, was part of a, uh, an approach to spiritual assessment and spiritual care that was developed um, uh, by William Baldridge and John Gleason. Uh, they were CPE educators. Um, and the original essay was in 1978, um, and then Gleason actually went on and published uh, two other essays about it in 1990, 1999. So there has been a little bit of work in our field around this, but again, it was work that didn't get broadly picked up. Um, but those of you who are kind of interested in the history of these ideas uh, do want to note that um, um, uh, some CP educators were working with these ideas um, in the latter part of the 20th century. Andy, let's look at the next slide. Um, so uh, as a researcher, I'm kind of interested in the details about the measurement. So your multi-scale measure for post-conventional spiritual functioning, um, if we could just kind of you know, get into the nuts and bolts of that. Your work's based a little bit on the work of David Wolf, a psychologist mm -hmm. at religion who describes spiritual functioning. Um, and his two axes, um, um, uh, one is about... Um, um, uh, conventional, post-conventional, um, um, but his other axis is around kind of belief in a higher power. And you changed that, if I understand correctly, from belief in a higher power to affiliation versus not affiliation. Am I understanding you correctly? And can you say a little bit about why you'd made that change? And, and then what does that mean for um, uh, people who have no history of affiliation? which is gonna to begin to be part of what we see in society. Yeah. Right. So there's definitely more to the story that Tim, am I jumping in too quickly? Did you want to respond to this question? Okay. So the reason I changed the language was primarily about being able to name the subscales of the instrument in one or two words. So, it was a matter of trying to find language we could use so that it wouldn't take a sentence to describe the title of a subscale. The concept is intended as very similar. 
one of the things that we were noticing in the Fowler Religious Attitude Scale revised that was causing a measurement problem is that instrument would ask people if their beliefs were the same as the people who first taught them about their culture, faith, laws, et cetera. And if they said that their ideas were very different from those who originally inculcated them into a culture, they were being classed as post-conventional. There are people who take a really concrete, brittle God concept, find that, that it doesn't hold up for them, change their beliefs without exploring that God concept further. They are disaffiliates. They looked post-conventional on our original measure because they didn't have the same beliefs, but they hadn't used a post-conventional process to get to that place. So those were the people we were trying to describe because it seemed clear to us that they were having some special needs. Um, I have been looking over the instrument, which is derived from another instrument came, coming directly from and looking at the language and seeing that some of those items might work very well with people who never had a faith affiliation. Some of those items might need tweaking to work well with that group. I think we need to do more research with this instrument. It is our first study with this instrument and we're excited that we have been able to find things with this instrument that have been part of our clinical experience that we have been un unable to document to this point. But I do think that there is some more refinement that we can do with the instrument. Thanks. Um, Kristen, are you ready um, with a couple of the questions? There's been a lot of rich questions, actually, as I've kind of um, looked at um, uh, the questions that are coming in. Do you want to give us uh, one or two sure. of them? Um, yeah, so we, there have been a number of questions um, focused on um, just in general application um, of some of the thoughts that have emerged as a result of the presentation, which is a wonderful presentation. Um, a number of concerns were expressed in particular about how to help people, given that um, uh, it's helpful to people, um, it seems helpful to people to have a more advanced form of, of faith or spirituality. How can we help people move from a conventional faith to a post-conventional faith? Is that something that you've seen literature about that might be helpful to people? Yeah, I mean, what I would say, one way to, to look that up is if you want to look up uh, Irene and I's article 2018 on building spiritual strength. I don't know if we describe, actually, I take that back. If you can find the American Psychological Association just put out, uh, a, a, there's a chapter in that book, Moral Injury, I think it's Understanding Moral Injury in Clinical Practice. Uh, Joe Courier was one of the editors. We describe build, this building spiritual strength intervention in more detail and specifically session two, uh, if you read about that would be an example of how uh, Irene designed an intervention around that and building spiritual strength which what that, that is, is a, it's a modified empty chair exercise, which you could to a degree do individually. Uh, but what we do in that is introduce different uh, interpretations of, of a distressing event. Um, so you could do that individually as well. And when you're seeing someone being caught up in a single moral interpretation of an event, um, and, and again, appropriately, ethically, however you find uh, you do this in your practice, you can, you can raise another interpretation. Um, of, of that event or another moral context that may have been at play. Uh, when the, frequently with veterans, we see themselves uh, blaming themselves for something that was maybe or maybe not within their control uh, and sometimes pointing to other moral contexts or other forms of agency in those situations uh, can be really helpful. And I'll, I'll let Irene add to that too. Right, so in the building spiritual strength intervention, since our goal is to get people from Fowler 3 to Fowler 4, we use both ideas from Fowler's work and some ideas from an educational psychologist, Edward Vygotsky, that takes a look at what we need to do to get to the next level on cognitive scaffolding. So the procedure that we use is right down to the neurological level to push people into being able to consider multiple perspectives at the same time. We ask an individual and group to bring up an issue. We then enforce 
quiet time. Um, because if we didn't take quiet time, people would simply respond out of their gut. They wouldn't think about what to do. It's the same way that when you have a child with ADHD and you give them an, a manipulative problem to solve, you hold their hands for a minute before you let them touch the material so that they actually think first. We then allow each member of the group to take a perspective on the issue that the individual brought up. And only after having both quiet time and having to process multiple perspectives without getting a chance to interrupt or respond, only after integrating all of that does the individual get to speak again and start to integrate all of those ideas. So these are the pieces of the recipe. Inhibit reflexive responses and ask the person to think about multiple perspectives before they can respond. That was probably more than you wanted. <laughs> yeah, let, let no, me jump in here. Uh, Kristen, if I can um, jump in sure. a second. I, 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 I think it's important uh, in some sense to underscore that the intervention Tim and Irene have developed is a six session, eight session group intervention. And what does it mean to use these concepts in care for individuals, individual patients, individual family members, individual healthcare professionals? That that's a work in process in some sense for all of us to develop and think about together um, and use our case study research and publish case studies where chaplains have done this thoughtfully um, a, as a way to um, actually begin to um, uh, work on that together. Um, well, Kristen, I'm also going to kind of bump in here. The, the, one of the questions was, uh, Tim, could you remind us again where that chapter is about peer, building spiritual strengths? And is that in the book that Irene helped co-edit, right? Is that in the book that Kristen, uh, Crystal Park edited with you guys? It's in no. a different book. So it's different. a separate book. I think it was Joe Courier, Jason Newsma, and was it? Drescher, I'm, I'm not remember who the third editor was, if there was one, uh, but it was called Addressing Moral Injury in Clinical Practice. Uh, it came out digitally last year, I want to say a hard copy this year. Um, so I think if you Google and or Google Scholar Courier Moral Injury in Clinical Practice APA, it should come up. Uh, and that's where the, um, the, the chapter is. Yeah, and if you send us that reference, actually, we'll post it so that people can yeah. find it. Yeah, uh, I'm sure to have it. Kristen, I'm sorry, back to you. Maybe no, time. No for one of... Yeah, I know we're um, uh, short on time. I have uh, sort of three questions, two quite quick ones, and then one longer question. Uh, the first, first two have to do with the quick ones have to do with the sample. Um, you had mentioned that people rarely progress beyond conventional faith. So the question was. Um, how many in your study were people who actually had progressed beyond that? Um, there was some thought it might be very difficult to get a number of people for a study who had a post-conventional faith. Um, and then the other question about the sample was in regard to the racial diversity of it and a notation that it seemed to be a pretty homogeneous sample. I'm wondering if you could um, respond to that as well. So I would have to go back to the article to look up, actually it wouldn't even be in the article i would need to go back to the data to look up who would be above cut off it for post-conventional spiritual development but that is a really good question because if we had too few people functioning at post-conventional levels that might explain the lack of the protective finding we expected to have and then what was the other question i apologize about racial diversity yeah, the racial diversity was actually typical of the part of Minnesota in which the sample was drawn. Um, and I completely agree, we need to do some more studies with larger samples in more diverse areas. And we're actually acting with other VAs to try to get data from more diverse areas. And then that last question um, that I had I don't know, time that we have, it concerns the application of the findings to issues faced by frontline workers in the pandemic. Um, the person asking the question says, it sounds like the research applies mainly to veterans. But she's wondering if uh, there's anything learned in the study that can be applied to moral distress or injury occurring as a result of the pandemic. For example, frontline workers distressed by isolation and lack of visits by family to dying COVID patients. 
Um, another example, moral distress at decisions around who gets to be on a ventilator um, or who gets a vaccine. And question if you can comment on the applicability to that situation. Sure, I was going to ask Tim if, oh, Tim is back. Um, Tim, you weren't here when that question was asked though, were you? Yeah, we, no, I heard it. We've we've been the faces have been disappearing. So I, I'll respond briefly, and then I'll I, Irene respond. So uh, I would say uh, isolation is a different question potentially than co the collision of moral context. So making uh, different decisions about ventilators or who gets one and who doesn't. Um, and th those are potentially different things, unless there's a sense of uh, a moral judgment on I shouldn't have to be alone as a healthcare professional and people should be supporting me, then that might be a similar process morally to deciding what, why does this person get a ventilator and, th and this not. Uh, and where I would say this is, um, there's far more similarities now than pre-pandemic is that the, the prevalence of these moral dilemmas in healthcare with the pandemic, uh, well, let me, the prevalence or awareness of them in the media is definitely higher. I, I don't know uh, people that are, are well versed or have worked in healthcare long enough are, are very familiar with with racial and, and income disparities around care. Um, but I think the pandemic brought this to the media's attention enough where people are seeing these moral dilemmas um, that were more similar or maybe more uh, classically considered in military contexts or combat contexts. But Irene, do you want to respond to that? Right. I think that there is something at the core of both the military moral injury issues and the healthcare moral injury issues that it distills down to the same issue. And that is the issue of multiple moral contexts so that something is right in one context and wrong. So for example, when we get to the point of rationing care to withhold a ventilator from one patient is wrong in the context of that patient's treatment team. From a different perspective, providing that patient a ventilator withholds a ventilator from another patient. And so in that perspective, then it might be the right thing to do. So we're talking about multiple moral contexts. Similarly, the decision about do I keep my job in healthcare? If I go to work, I need to do that to take care of people who are in distress and who are dying, and that is the mission of my profession and what I chose to give my life to. In that moral context, it is the right thing to do to go to work. From the context of being somebody who cares for a family and taking the risk that one might bring a virus home to a family, especially if one lives with elderly relatives, exactly the same behavior might get classed as wrong. So the issue of bringing up to people who are morally distressed that they are making decisions with multiple moral context, more than one perspective, there's more than one way to look at them, there's more than one way to classify something as right or wrong and to start to things and to start to view themselves and to start to view people around them as on a continuum rather than in a category. Um, Irene, Tim, uh, we're at the top of the hour. Um, it's clear we could kind of continue this conversation for uh, another good hour. Um, lots of rich material, um, um, yeah, but we are going to have to draw to a close. Uh, friends, I thank everyone for participating today. Um, I hope it's been a stimulating conversation, opening you up to some new ideas, new possibilities. We're not finished with this work. We don't have the final answers. That can be a little frustrating for practitioners who've got to get out there and take care of patients and staff today and tomorrow who'd like to know exactly what to do. Um, but we think it's important to actually to have begun the conversation and we appreciate uh, Irene, Tim, uh, your guidance uh, as we kind of um, uh, engage these concepts, think about what they mean for the patients, family, staff that we're caring for. We're looking Looking forward to kind of your uh, learning from you guys as you continue your research and perhaps, you know, being able to expand um, uh, the, the, the research with these concepts with other populations. So uh, thanks uh, uh, again to you, Kristen. Thanks for helping us out with the Q&A. Friends, uh, thanks for uh, joining us in the webinar. 
Um, uh, we'll post the recording, we'll post the slides, we'll post the references, uh, and we'll continue the conversation um, as we uh, do everything we can to help our patients and families. Take care, friends. Be well. Thanks. Thanks so much, guys. That was really awesome. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks for having us. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. You too. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.